Please continue eating. We're going to go ahead and get, get started. It is my great honor to introduce today's speaker, who I'm very excited to hear from today. Our speaker is Meng Xiong, president of Purdue University and the Roscoe H. George Distinguished Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Meng began, became president, Purdue's 13th president on January 1st, 2023, and is the youngest university president in the Association of American Universities. In his previous role as the Dean of College of Engineering, Meng led the college to its first back-to-back -back top four graduate rankings in the US, while growing it to be the largest top 10 undergraduate engineering college in the country. As the Executive Vice President for Strategic Initiatives, Meng worked with many colleagues to help launch initiatives in national security, technology, and semiconductor and life science manufacturing. His career has included time as a professor, chairman, and director at Princeton University. He even had a stint in Washington, D.C. as a diplomat and policymaker. He also co-funded three startup companies and has 25 U.S. patents, a few more than me. <laughs> Meng is a Chinese-American immigrant, husband, father of three, and most importantly, fan of ice cream. Please help me welcome Meng to Indianapolis as we invite him up to the stage. Yeah, you're very welcome. You. You're very welcome. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. Um, now I'm reminded I still need to pay your company my bill from last month. <laughs> and uh, I want to thank the entire Economic Club of Indiana for this outstanding privilege for me to be here with you this afternoon. And deep appreciation to all the leadership, current and past. Thank you, Mario, as well. Thank you for the free bottles of water at the Indy Airport. I always take about a dozen on my way out. Uh, <laughs> I know I'm bankrupting our airport, uh, but we do need to keep tuition frozen at Purdue, so. <laughs> well, Jeff, I, sh I think I should just stop and step down. That's the highlight. Uh, you know, I, I uh, told my predecessor, Mitch, who gave us the Daniels a decade at Purdue, that I'll have the privilege and honor to be here with all of you today. And he said, uh, please don't put all of them to sleep. Uh, so I'll try not to do that. Uh, there is the outstanding chairman of the Board of Trustees, Michael Berghoff. <laughs> Mike, please don't snore too loud, like last time when I was talking somewhere, you know, and. Uh, you know, I started hearing this loud snore is because I put my chairman to sleep already. Uh, well, um, people ask me, so how does it feel to step into the shoes, the incredibly large shoes of Mitch Daniels? And I said, look, you know, the homework is already given to me, you know, so it's kind of a simple job in that sense. I'll tell you the homework. And I need you to help me to work on these homework together. And there are three homeworks today. But before that, I also want to share with you three unique features in the DNA of Purdue University. And I hesitate to describe too much about economics here in front of all the business and nonprofit leaders of the Economic Club of Indiana. You know, I once tried to do startup companies, and then I realized it's kind of difficult, so I came back to academia and hide behind the longevity of universities. Uh, I tried my luck in Washington, D.C. for one year as a science and tech advisor to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. And then I realized that the paperwork is just too much for me. So I found my Goldilocks right here, sort of, uh, you know, it's not too much bureaucracy, it's, uh, you know, too, not too much risk. I'm right here in the middle uh, in academia. But not all academic institutions are the same. Some are better than others. Boiler up, Purdue is the best. <laughs> By the way, Jeff, uh, please remind uh, both of us when it's Q&A time, we do not need to talk about football this week, OK? Uh, <clears throat> we can talk about the stadium that was under budget on time completion. But uh, 
Well, Purdue is different. And I say, yes, of course, you say that, Mon. You are paid to say that. Yes, I am paid to say that. It has the convenient virtue of being true. It's different, first, that it is about student access and success. Twelve years in a row of frozen tuition. The Board of Trustees just approved recently the twelfth year. The EDR, let's do some economic math here, um, and correct me if my, ma my math is wrong, but uh, the earning to debt ratio, if you take the first graduate year's salary once you get out of Purdue with your degree and divide by the total student debt averaged over all the students graduating that year. Now, you want this ratio to be as big as possible. So make a guess, what was the ratio of earnings to debt ratio for Purdue graduate on average last year? One, two, six, 6.0, two to be specific. So that means pre-tax, two months of your salary right after college is enough to pay back the entirety of the debt you accumulated to get the degree in the first place. That's assuming you don't eat for two months, but uh, <clears throat> let's say disposable income, somewhere around one year. That's enough to pay back the entirety. That's why, perhaps, plus the Boilermaker spirit, 99.2% of Purdue graduates pay back their student loan entirely. It's about student success. We have now 50,000 students on the main campus, 105,000 across all the regional campuses, and Purdue Global and Purdue University Online. Uh, and uh, if you look at where they go afterwards, you see the big delta, and that is the spirit of public land-grant institutions, that education is the great equalizer. Education can uplift people's lives and their families' futures. When they came into Purdue, and when they leave the university, you see that big positive delta, and we are so, so proud of that. I meet many boilermakers around the country and the world. Many of them say John Everson, who named the deanship at Purdue many years ago and former trustee. He pointed to me of his Chicago lake house, one of his many houses, says, Meng, look, that living room, me and my siblings, my parents, we grew up in a place the entire place is smaller than that living room right now. And he said, I owe it all to Purdue education, student access and success. Second, it's about excellence at scale. You want both excellence and scale. We know the scale. What about the excellence? If you believe rankings, and I like those rankings that rank us high, the rest I brush aside. Uh, <laughs> The economic data must be wrong, the, the biased methodology over there. But um, our entire College of Agriculture, final four in America, entire College of Engineering, final four in America. There are many other departments that are final four, if not number one in America. The number of patents received by Purdue faculty students last year, number four in America. Our basketball team is going to be a final four in America. Well, Zach is back, and the whole team is ready, and the women's basketball is going to do very well as well this season. So uh, if you think about that chart, right, let's plot a two-dimensional chart here. It's the economic club. Uh, the x-axis is the enrollment number. It's a reflection of scale. And the y-axis is, let's say, some composite ranking reflecting excellence. There is no other university in America today that is able to say, I'm both bigger and better than Purdue. There is no such university in America today. I'm very proud of the team we have, excellence at scale. And third unique DNA for us is our focus in creating jobs, workforce, and innovation together, right here in central Indiana and indeed through our extension offices throughout the 92 counties in the entire state of Indiana. What I mean by co-generating these three things together? Well, we want brain gain. 
We want people to come here, maybe because they're out-of-state students coming to Purdue and stay in Indiana. But they're not going to stay here to be unemployed. We need jobs. We need jobs because of startups and entrepreneurs, like Rally Conference right here, this building, a week ago. We need jobs because existing companies are doubling down, such as our dear friends over in Eli Lilly, uh, in Lebanon district, uh, such as Cummins and many others. And we need jobs coming from new companies, uh, such as Saab, uh, such as uh, MediaTek, uh, such as Skywater Semiconductors, to come here and create new jobs. However, when they come here and say, well, you are one of the 50 states we're looking uh, to potentially create a new site and bring a 1,000 well-paying jobs and careers, uh, but what is different here than other places? Yes, there's the stable, pro-business, economic, political, infrastructure environment. But also there is outstanding workforce and innovation out of our universities. We are number one per capita manufacturing workforce in the state. And we are one of the very best in workforce readiness in STEM disciplines. There is no other top university in America than Purdue in terms of STEM undergraduate enrollment is one of the many outstanding features after the Daniels decade. And that workforce and job creation have to go hand in hand together. Without the workforce, the jobs won't come. Without the jobs, the workforce won't stay. And beneath both, we need innovation. I made a very bad joke the other day, and then this is, I can see behind closed doors, I'll relay that. Uh, you know, very bad joke when I was talking to one of the reporters asking about semiconductors work. And in a moment, trying to be witty and clever and cute, and I've learned my lesson, never try that again. Uh, I said, you know, this is like engineers eating the economist's lunch. And then I said, whoops, did I just say that? Uh, so I don't mean what I said, now I guess. What I meant to say is that innovation is the powerful method that can redraw the economic boundary conditions, that can rewrite the economic equations. Take one example. Semiconductors, everything needs chips. Automobiles need chips. Computers, fighter jets, they all need chips. Chips needs to be made and packaged. The packaging capability of our country is now dwindled down to 2%, 2% of global supply. There is economic reason why, because it is labor intensive and low margin. So until and unless faculty such as those at Purdue University create new innovation so that we can redraw the economic equation, so that packaging in semiconductors is innovation intensive instead of labor intensive so that there's new products that will command a higher profit margin by being closer to customers. Until then, we're not going to be able to sustain, no matter how much federal dollars are going to be pumped into the system, we're not going to be able to sustain onshoring and reshoring these great manufacturing jobs of this century until and unless the economic equation is rewritten by innovation. And that is what we mean by co-generating workforce and jobs and innovation together in the heart of American heartland. Now, there's going to be a quiz at the end. What are the three defining features of Purdue's spirit? Well, let me give you another trio, perhaps, another trifecta before we sit down with Jeff here. Back to the three homework. Well, make a guess. What's the first homework I got? Where's the sign? There's supposed to be a beautiful picture showing you Purdue University in Indianapolis. Let's talk about that. June 14th, both Purdue and IU's boards met and signed what I believe is a great momentous declaration of commitment to this city and the state. Instead of one plus one equal half, let's say, now it's going to be one plus one equal three. 
And we deeply appreciate all the support from the business community right here in central Indiana. We appreciate also IU's partnership, working on this together. IU is a fine institution. Other than five days a year, the other 360 days of the year, we're all part of one team Indiana. And that day was one of those 360 days uh, that we came together. And Purdue University Indianapolis will be unleashing the full power that you can imagine of Purdue University main campus right here in our capital city. And you can imagine what this would do to the student experiences. What about 50% of all student times must be spent on meaningful internships and co-op opportunities with your companies? What about recruiting talents and spousal hires in an urban setting? What about medicine and health and sports and entrepreneurship? All those arenas where a densified, concentrated, connected talent pipeline must be created. A unique urban setting. For Purdue, this will be the first time we have a comprehensive urban campus. And I can't tell you how excited we are, the board, the administration, the faculty, student staff, the future students, and their families. And we want this to be a major investment so that your companies can recruit the workforce we just talked about right here, Purdue University in Indianapolis. And this, <clears throat> thank you. I know at least one table isn't falling asleep yet. Don't worry, we'll uh, make you uh, want to fall asleep in no time. But, uh, but this is not just about one city either. Yes, we'll have multiple locations throughout the city, including High Alpha and Bottle Work District. But also, this is the other bookend of America's hard tech corridor. On the one hand, you've got Purdue University in Indianapolis. On the other hand, you've got West Lafayette, Discovery Park District that Mitch created, creating jobs right there. And now, along this 65-mile-long stretch, we're going to together create jobs, opportunities for all Hoosiers. Passing through, so happens, at the midpoint, Governor Holcomb's signature of LEAP Innovation District in Lebanon. The other homework I was given is revamping our business school. Now, we do have, for many decades, an outstanding Craner graduate program in industrial management. And now, this state, this country, the business communities demand Purdue to do more. And we have stepped up to do more. Naming now the Mitchell E. Daniels Jr. School of Business, DSB. And it's a fitting tribute to my predecessor, not only because what he did for Purdue, but also to recognize his contribution as a business leader in the state and the country. And you ask, so what is Daniel School of Business going to be different from other public-private universities' business schools? Well, the basic premise is very simple. With excellence at scale, the Daniel School of Business will be creating, at the top 10 business school in the country level, many future leaders and entrepreneurs who can lead in a tech-driven free market economy. And when we say free market, we do mean, yes, free enterprises, free market, entrepreneurial, capitalistic economy that can create jobs, opportunities, and prosperity. And we have integrated business engineering degree. We have a new business analytics degree. And imagine that all the future graduates of DSB will be literate with AI, with a future of job displacement and creation. The third homework, thank goodness only three main homeworks, otherwise this will go on for a while. Uh, the third homework, Purdue computes. So we got a new campus, we got a new college, got a new initiative. And Purdue computes 
is again a reflection of a public land-grant institution's responsibility to the market signal. The teenagers and their parents are voting with their feet. This past year, we had a record number of applicants to our undergraduate class, 72,800 applicants. And well over 10,000 applicants applied to one major, computer science and thousands more to computer engineering and AI and data science majors. We had to turn away many, many thousands of outstanding applicants because just not enough space. So part of Purdue Compute is to expand our faculty advisor capability to accommodate more Hoosier and other states students demand. Another part is a university-wide research institute called the Institute of Physical AI, IPAI. You know, we spend a lot of time thinking about acronyms. So now IPI has nothing to do with your dessert just now or the mathematical quantity, uh, but it is all about bringing the bytes of AI with the atoms of what we grow, what we make, and what we move, the three things we know how to do very well in this state. AI's potential is far greater than just helping high school students write essays. What about agriculture industry, digital ag? What about a manufacturing industry, AI-based manufacturing? Our intent is to be the nation's leading institute when it comes to physical AI. And we are recruiting outstanding leaders it's all about the who before the what. In the case of business school, for example, this summer we recruited Dr. Jim Bullard, who was the longest serving president of a Federal Reserve Bank, 15 years, leading the Fed in St. Louis to be the inaugural dean of the Daniel School of Business. And now we are recruiting an outstanding director for IPI. If you have names, please let us know. We are piloting something I think it's quite innovative across American universities, is that when everybody wants to hire the best AI talents, how can we make sure they come to our state? So Purdue University is ready and eager to partner with companies, large and small, to recruit talents together. Maybe a 50-50 split. We'll figure out the IP, we'll figure out the time, but we want to be creative and just bring the best talent to our ecosystem. Now, all the computing happens in some kind of silicon chips. When I was at State Department in 2020, a lot of times, you know, there were a lot of economists in the room, very few nerdy engineers like myself. So I said, you know, this, you know, advanced packaging for chips is essential foundation to the national security and job security of this country. And then people asked me afterwards, they said, hey, Meng, are you sure? Packaging potato chips is the foundation of national security. I say, not that chip and not that packaging. Now we don't have to explain to anyone because we all recognize the entire digital economy rests on the foundation of our ability to design, to manufacture, and to package and distribute silicon chips. And I'm proud to say your university, Purdue, is America's number one leading university in semiconductors. When it comes to workforce development, through our semiconductor degrees program, I caught up all the CEOs, 17 gave us the endorsement. We have a whole industry advisory board so that we teach what's most relevant. When it comes to research and innovation, $250 million of federal research funding came to Purdue Semiconductor over the past number of years. And we are doing more in the future with CHIPS Act. And we are leading in industry partners. Skywater's Fab coming, MediaTek Design Center coming, and just yesterday afternoon, I had the pleasure to go down to Naval Surface Warfare Center, Crane, to announce P3, permanent presence of Purdue at Crane. And we'll be in there, what they call Foundry One, for semiconductor fabrication innovation, along with companies such as Enhanced and Everspeen. And we are leading the country in like-minded nations partnerships. 
We signed a G7, the U.S.-Japan Semiconductor Alliance, working with India Semiconductor Mission, while bringing IMAC, Europe's headquarters of semiconductors innovation, right here to West Lafayette, Indiana. So if you put chips, physical AI, and computing together, that is what we call Purdue Computes. Well, I think that's enough homework. We are doing a few other things. We're doing the ABCs of serving the state. A for airport, to serve Greater Lafayette. B, broadband, working with Lieutenant Governor's team and making sure that the federal $868 million for Indiana will be spent in strategic ways to help all the rural communities and certain urban communities to get their broadband up to speed. And C is that corridor. Let's think about that corridor for just one more minute. When we look around here, this room, look around this city, and look around this hard tech corridor, where transportation, aerospace, the smart crossroads of America, where semiconductor, microelectronic industries, where ag biopharma manufacturing industries, we will be creating jobs, talent, and innovation like never before, with the speed, with the impact, with the intent and intensity that will be the envy of all the other Midwestern and indeed all the other states in the United States. And that is the mission that Purdue is on, but we cannot do that alone. We need your help. We need your help to work together on these many, many homeworks and the future homeworks that will undoubtedly arise for our state. We're going to play underdog. I tell you one anecdote before Jeff and I get the chance to chat. When you have two dots on a chart, and I promise this is the last mathematical economics notion, two dots on a chart, and you try to draw a straight line. My high school daughter just quizzed me about how to write, you know, a linear equation in three different ways, and you know, so on. Uh, well, there's just one straight line you can draw. That's called extrapolation. Nothing magical about that. When well, you have only one dot on the chart, and you try to draw a line with a steep slope upwards, as we are doing now, that's not extrapolation. That is imagination. But I love something even more. When well, you have no dot on the line, there's no line. And you say, you know what? I see a tremendous exponential growth curve for all the Hoosiers on the graph. I see that. When there's no dot, let's make the dots. We call that hallucination. <laughs> well, I tell you what, let's go hallucination together as Hoosiers. Boiler up, thank you so much. Well, Meng, uh, thank you so much. Uh, again, Welcome. let's give him a round of applause. Amazing. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, still no football, okay? <laughs> no football. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we appreciate your making um, Indiana your home, um, and then again, following in the footsteps of a, of a great leader in, in terms of Mitch um, with respect to Purdue University. So, so thank you for that. No, um, I'm honored and blessed. Thank you again. So we, you've, you've do, actually done a, a quite a bit of work um, at a relatively young age, um, but I'm not mad at you. Um, can you can you help us understand what keeps you uh, engaged, um, inspired, and and driving? Um, what are what are some? Can you share with us some of your your daily habits? Hmm. The short answer is ice cream, <laughs> as you mentioned already. Yes. Uh, and I tell you, the best is what's called affogato. Uh, and uh, the Italian word apparently means that you drown gelato with espresso. Ah. And uh, you think about, well, I won't have a shot of espresso in the afternoon, uh, but it's kind of bitter. So I need cold. I need cream. I need sugar. Wait a moment. That is called ice cream. So 
You put the two together, it works beautifully. Now, I'm getting digressed here. I forgot what was your, ah, your question is about uh, sort of uh, why I am aging so fast now with this job. Yes, I am aging very fast, so don't worry about the youth part. But, uh, you know, I tell you, it's really because there's a sense of purpose that we're on a mission. It's not just a job, mm -hmm. that we've got a whole team on a mission. And when we fight against other states to win economic development deals, mm -hmm. with IEDC, with ARI, with CICP, with the support from Lilly Endowment, mm -hmm. we end up winning. And we say, that's particularly sweet, because it doesn't come natural to our state. It doesn't come natural to our university that when you are competing for talents, for opportunities, mm -hmm. and there are many other states in this beautiful country, uh, and it's because that every morning when I wake up, I get bombarded with great news and some other news as well. But you know, and you look at the people, the boilermakers, the faculty inventing yet another outstanding device, the students winning yet another scholarship, right? the staff dedicating themselves to the mission we are on together. And that's what gives me the motivation and say, look, the whole team is running like this. How can I not run as fast as the rest of the team? And uh, that, I guess, is even more important than ice cream. <laughs> well, great, uh, great leadership on, on your part. And we've got some questions from the audience. Mm. Um, Someone asks, what is your vision for the new Academic Student Success Center in Indianapolis? Hmm. I assume this is a question from the audience about this particular building that we mentioned in the state legislature request. We're very grateful for Indiana's General Assembly's support in many ways, including this one. Uh, and we had a $80 million ask, received a $60 million allocation, and we'll fundraise the rest. Uh, and this is going to be the first new building in the core campus of Purdue University in Indianapolis. It's going to serve three functions. One is that there will be labs and lectures in this new academic success building. And we want to bring in all the degrees of majors and programs from West Lafayette. This is not a regional university. There is no separate chancellor. This is part of our main campus. Mm -hmm. So we want to bring in HTM, Daniel School of Business, pharmacy and nursing. A pharmacy is already here in a different building right now. Uh, and we need the space to grow it. Two is that there will be student advising and internship opportunities. And we borrow a page from the Gateway Complex uh, that we constructed with wonderful support from Lilly Endowment and from state legislature and some wonderful alum. It got completed at the end of last year. And there's something called Hoosier Hot Corners. The alliterating name was suggested by Mitch a few years back. And we place Indiana companies, large and small, in the mix of the classroom so that they can talk to the students, and you can recruit the talents in you need. And the third function is that uh, we'll be looking at uh, uh, how can we have a industry <coughs> conversation around the most burning needs uh, for our state and for our capital city. So there will be co-working space for student startups. There will be uh, places where you can have meetings. It doesn't have to be a Purdue-specific uh, topic. But we want this to be a convening spot for a lot of great, brilliant minds in Indianapolis get together. Right. So it's going to serve three functions. And uh, there's going to be an ice cream shop in there, too. <laughs> Actually, I'm not sure about that. Uh, I better stop talking about ice cream. <laughs> it's making me hungry. I'm an ice cream lover as well. You can talk about it all you like. Um, our next question is, how much does quantum computing factor into Purdue's semiconductor mm. and computes initiative? Mm. And is that technology viable in the next five years? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll first tell you a little story. 
every time I hear the word quantum, I say, oh no. Because when I was a freshman at a university I attended, and in the middle of my first quarter, I was taking this quantum mechanics course. Well, the professor got a Nobel Prize. So he came in and said, guess what? I got a Nobel Prize in physics for something called fractional quantum Hall effect. I don't know what that is, but, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and he said, uh, guess what? Uh, there's not gonna be a final, because I'm gonna be busy preparing my acceptance speech in Stockholm. I don't have time for you freshmen to design a final <laughs> exam. So, everybody gets an A. And I say, hooray! Up to that point, I had no clue what was going on in class. So I say, I got an A. Uh, and then this student next to me, he raised his hands, said, but professor, I was expecting A plus. I say, you're not gonna survive in this society long. You know? uh, and then the professor said, well, this is a socialist version of quantum mechanics. If you want A plus, you go to a capitalist uh, uh, class. Uh, well, that's my most uh, impressive lesson in teaching me that socialism doesn't work because I still don't know what quantum mechanics is. It took the pressure off of my mind, so I never studied and never learned. I got an A, guaranteed. But I have been taught by my dear colleagues at Purdue uh, that uh, Purdue is actually one of the top five, I would say, leading quantum science and engineering institutions. Uh, and there are others, you know, Chicago and MIT and Stanford, they are reasonable as well. Uh, and uh, we, we are particularly strong in a collaboration with Microsoft. You know, there are these three companies that run, I guess, everything in our life. Mm -hmm. Microsoft, Google, Amazon. Hey, what's Apple doing here? I don't know, but uh, <laughs> well, each of those three companies has invested many billions of dollars over many, many years. Microsoft picked one single university to be the primary research collaborator, and that is Purdue University with Professor Mike Manfra. We've got other outstanding professors as well. So, I'm grateful for whoever asked this question. In fact, we are now elevating quantum science and engineering to be another pillar, the fourth pillar, mm -hmm. under the Purdue Compute umbrella. Because the future, once you get down to this two nanometer feature size on a microchip, at some point, either you move the value over to the packaging stage, which is what we're doing and leading the country in, or you have to be basically operating at the atomic level. And uh, you know, if you watch Oppenheimer, you know, I don't get most of what the movie is about, but uh, it's uh, gonna be at quantum level. Uh, so semiconductor and quantum will be getting closer to each other. Again, all comes down to the talent you can recruit. It's all coming down to who are the coaches, who are the student athletes you can recruit against the competing institutions who want the same set of talents. And I, at Purdue, are very blessed to have outstanding quantum scientists and engineers, and this will be elevated going forward. Great, thank you. Let's talk um, a little bit about, you talked about the, uh, the corridor through mm. Boone County. Are you concerned about the stress uh, of uh, potential water supply mm -hmm. development in the Boone County area? Look, we all need water. Uh, the whole corridor needs water. West Lafayette, Discovery Park District, with all these companies coming in, they need water as well. And we understand there's Eli Lilly, and there are, I hope, many other great job-creating opportunities in Leap District. They will need water as well. So what I've been saying is two very simple things. Number one, let's first figure out the data, how much water there is. Now, it fluctuates. It's not a single number. It's a whole chart, mm -hmm. right? The economists study charts and time series all the time. There are seasonality change. There are years more wet than other years. But let's plot the chart, look at the data first. And I think IEDC has been now gathering that data. And David Rosenberg and I have chat recently. We're gonna look at the data. Number two, I believe we can find win-win solutions through a consultative process. Especially if the answer to the first part is yes, there can be enough water, but let's make sure the process is gonna be generated in order to drive 
a win-win for everyone along this corridor. I am confident we can get to that point. Great. Thank you. Let's um, continue on the, the, the economic development front and talk about um, North Carolina has the research triangle. Mm. How can Indiana leverage the LEAP District and our growing tech and industry investments into our own research circle? Mm -hmm. I like these geometric objects. <laughs> uh, it was a very nerdy luncheon indeed. Uh, so triangle. Well, first of all, yesterday afternoon, uh, down in Crane, we talked about the triangle. Mm -hmm. uh, a semiconductor chips triangle, because Crane is doing amazing things. National security defense, hypersonics, semiconductor. And uh, let's think about this quantum corridor up north. Purdue Northwest, right? Uh, it is a economic driving engine as well for that part of our state. If you think about Fort Wayne, what's amazing happening there is amazing, right? All the jobs created, companies coming, the downtown is vibrant, the hotel, the riverfront, mm -hmm. right? And it just makes you proud as a Hoosier going to Fort Wayne. So let's think about that triangle there. I'll say it's triangles, it's a plural form. There'll be more than one triangle. And think about Kokomo with Stellantis and Samsung coming in, right? That is basically, you know, due east out of West Lafayette, due north up from here. And there are many other parts of the state as well. You know, the one of the reasons I'm going around the state to visit all 92 counties is to appreciate the different challenges and opportunities and what Purdue can do through our extension offices and engagement offices to work with all of them. So I'll say yes, maybe a circle, mm -hmm. but maybe multiple triangles. Great. Well, thank you um, very much. Let's give uh, Meng a, again a round of applause. <laughs> thank you all again so much for being with us here today. Today's presentation can be found um, at the Economic Club of Indiana.com. And so please join us also next month on October 25th as we welcome Shelley Lowe, the chair of the National Endowment for Humanities. Please be sure to purchase your tickets today uh, to join us again for that engaging conversation. Um, information can be found um, uh, for each of the season's presenters at the Economic Club of Indiana.com. And just as a quick reminder, if you've parked in the Plaza Park Garage, don't forget to pick up your QR code. Uh, take advantage of that parking. So please, everyone, have a wonderful evening and now, afternoon. Jeff, Thank if you. I may say one more thing. Oh, absolutely. In addition to parking, is something I have to say no matter what each time. Boiler up. <laughs>